time, Ralph, um, I wanted to say, isn't the movement to legalize marijuana um, an expansion of consciousness that's going on right now? Uh, the question is for you, Ralph, isn't the uh, present movement toward the legalization of marijuana evidence of the octave continuing in a positive direction? Well, the octave thing is just a model, you know, and there's lots of different octaves at work. And the situation is extremely complex. Uh, well, seems, so the seems... legalization of a, of a partial legalization of a substance, uh, uh, cannabis is an amazing substance, ancient, ancient healing plant. Not only healing, but with many other virtues of consciousness and expansion, uh, and appetite stimulation, medical application, very, very ancient, very, very potentially beneficial plant that's been illegal for 50 years. Why? It's potentially also a fantastically money-producing crop, and you know all kinds of ap applications in clothing and manufacture, and quite apart from its mind-expanding properties. And yet, why is it still illegal and treated as a drug with all these dangerous consequences, which have been demonstrated to be false many times over? You see, so. That's an interesting sociological historical question. Obviously, there are interests at work that want to keep it that way. And it probably, I can just guess, and you can guess as, as good as mine, it has to do with money. There's enormous amounts of money to be made, both illegally in the production of this crop by all kinds of international groups, it's not legal, and by the military industrial police enforcement complex in the enforcement of the prohibition, just like same as with alcohol prohibition, which is small potatoes compared to marijuana. So, and in amongst that, all of that, you know, uh, the potential positive, positive, therapeutic, beneficial, physically, and emotional, psychologically, beneficial healing plants, not to mention they've been the recreational. I mean, after all, what's wrong with recreation? And as a recreational drug, way, way more safe, more valuable, more interesting, and safer than the most popular recreational drug, alcohol, which is a... Uh, <laughs> except in, you know, more doses. <laughs> so. uh, here's a, a question, or rather, would you care to comment about this phenomenon that has been termed the globalization of ayahuasca, which is currently taking place. The globalization of ayahuasca? Yes. Well, um, uh, ayahuasca is a, is a South American um, spirit medicine, and spirit medicine means that it's a medicine that, uh, you know, in all, as in all indigenous cultures, medicine is not separated from spirituality, from spiritual growth, psychological problem solving, familial and social problem solving, and physical healing are all integrated together. It has an ancient traditional cu culture behind it, historical development behind it. And uh, it's become, and it has also this strange, this strange 20th century development that there are no less than three Brazilian churches organized around its use in a ceremonial recreational ceremonial of recreation ceremonial a religious ceremonial use and um, so uh, the introduction of this ancient shamanic ceremonial sacrament into modern culture is an interesting phenomenon i think from a psychological pharmacological Point of view, psychological growth point of view. I don't think ayahuasca is necessarily more interesting or more effective than, say, mushrooms or or psychedelic or LSD or peyote or any of these other substances. It's, it, but it has a certain cachet because it comes from a culture, and it's sort of legal, maybe sort of sometimes. And that's a big attraction. Naturally, because people have this strange thing. They don't want to go to jail for their religious practices or their healing practices. Strange, isn't it? Uh, and uh, whereas, you know, if you're taking mushrooms, then you already know you're doing something illegal. <laughs> no matter where you do it. So, but it's an interesting thing, you know. And it's, it's hard to, for people, I think, what I've seen in my 
forays into some of the, one of these cultures. Yeah, I mean, you can go to you can go to Bukalpa in Peru, and you can walk down the street, and you can buy a bottle of ayahuasca at a stall. You know, just like you can buy a bottle of whiskey at a stall. Ayahuasca, here it is, fifty pesos or whatever. No, 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 nothing. You don't have to do any ceremony, any introduction, any spiritual practice, nothing. You just buy it and chug around. <laughs> so what's that, you see? So, okay, so people are trying to make money, and they're indigenous people. We don't begrudge the indigenous people to make money by selling something that they have, a unique product, of course. That doesn't answer your question, but, you know, the question raises so many other interesting perspectives. Yeah. No, I mean... There are ceremonies now happening in Latvia, in yes. Finland, in, yeah. in Berlin, in Chicago, right. in Los Angeles, in all Tokyo. over the place. All over the place. What's that about? Yeah. Yes. What is it about? <laughs> <laughs> see, it has, has, it has, it has all over the globe. Well, it has this cachet. See, there's a. Uh, that's something I've noticed in you know because uh, I travel a lot in Germany. I've been to many of these countries. I've been to Latvia, but I've been to Estonia and. Um, uh, England and many times, and um, ayahuasca has acquired this this reputation. Uh, part of it is because it's accessible. I know I did my own, you know I published two books of collections of uh, psychic uh, experiences with and scientific articles about mushrooms and uh, psychoactive mushrooms and ayahuasca. The one on ayahuasca publishes ten sells about ten times as many copies. Now, I wonder why is that? You know? I mean. I must be not necessarily ten times as interesting, uh, and in fact, it has one big drawback compared to mushrooms, which it makes you slow up. It has this kind of there's this kind of strange mystique about throwing up with uh, with ayahuasca, you know, as if that was somehow. But that is a part of its healing virtue because it, what you throw up is not throwing up with ayahuasca is not a sign that you're sick. It means that you're a sign that you're getting rid of sickness that you already were carrying, you see. It's a completely different experience. You don't feel bad about after throwing up, you feel fantastic. People say, oh, I just threw up life. It's fantastic, better than I've ever felt in my whole life. That's not just an ordinary throwing up, you see. And uh, so that, like, it's really convincing. It's really convincing. And uh, uh, so I remember uh, in one... Uh, and I always used to say to people, I used to do, like, if you're in an ayahuasca session, pay attention to what you were thinking about just before you threw up. Because it was probably you were getting rid of something toxic. And what you were getting rid of may not be personal. That's the other thing. Because none of us is alone. We see. We're all connected to family. Of course, we know that. We're connected to society. I'll give you an example. A guy I know in a group that I participated in, they were taking ayahuasca. And... Um, uh, and I was taking ayahuasca, and uh, uh, for some reason I was thinking about the war in El Salvador. I started thinking about the war in El Salvador, which was going on in the Civil War, right? People were being massacred and decapitated and you know, all this brutal stuff that was going on. And the minute I started thinking about ayahuasca, I went blah! Now, I don't have any connection to El Salvador. I don't have any Salvador relatives, but I'm a human being. So I was connected to those people, and just the thought, just the thought, reminded me, tapped me into that part of the mass mind, and that part of it was toxic. So I, you know, I was part of the drainage system for that mass mind current. That's what happens. So when you throw, when you throw up and detoxify stuff, it may not even be personal. Sometimes it will be personal. You might throw up, you know, the child abuse that you had when you were a child, or uh, some other thing. But it may be just part of the culture. It could be, for example, a lot of that times when I was seeing the people that throw up the most are people that are regular smokers. So what they're throwing up all the accumulated toxins in their lungs from tobacco smoking over the decades, years. Does that make sense? Ralph, I have a question in the back here. Yeah. Um, in the beginning, you, you said something about effective and productive as two different ways of knowing. Right. And I'm wondering if you could say something, uh, what you feel about the training of therapists, given that distinction. About the training of therapists? Of therapists to do their medicine work. Yes. Well, the, yeah. Well, that's the thing. You know, so, you know, therapist training is, is part of the medical system. Medi th therapists are part of the medical system. 
Uh, that's not true in shamanic cultures. It's not true in indigenous cultures at all. Uh, it's all integrated. So certainly in the shaman, the shaman just tunes into what the spirits are that are in you. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the effective dose is an obsession of the medical pharmaceutical complex. The medical pharmaceutical complex is a criminal organization um, that is oriented towards making profit, nothing else, from drugs. Nothing else. And the only way they can make profit from dr selling drugs is by selling a drug that somebody else is not selling or hasn't sold before, that's somehow better, more effective at what? Curing some symptom. That's why you see an increasing list of symptoms appear every year in the DSM-4 the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. More, more and more symptoms that can be diagnosed. Once they have an official diagnosis, that means the medical pharmaceutical insurance complex, which are all connected, you know, will make the payments and the die, you get the doctors will get reimbursed. So but that doesn't apply to consciousness expansion, you see. How can you say talk about consciousness expansion? Uh, being effective in consciousness, what's the criterion? To, to, to have a criterion means you, it's not expanding. It's, 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 that's why I changed the subtitle from effective to productive. Productive of new understanding, new insights. And uh, uh, the, the, that's why Shogun, you know, was a genius chemist who made this enormous contribution by uh, publishing uh, the, the, his studies of, of new drugs and always holding the set in the setting concept because it was the same group of subjects, about a dozen people that he'd known for years who knew each other in the same kind of setting. So he was holding the set in the setting constant, just changing the dosages of the new drugs that he was testing out. So he could say, well, the differences in experience are due to this particular drug and this particular dosage. But he himself says he, think, he considers the the whole criterion on uh, the whole focus on effectiveness totally misguided uh, because um, uh, you, you, what do you, you know, you're expanding a consciousness, you don't know what's it's going to, that's why I say productive, productive of new understanding, new insights. Um, and uh, and the researchers always, I mean, I feel for the researchers, I support their research, I donate money to them because it's the only kind of research that's allowed to be done officially. To do the double blind placebo controlled studies. But I think they're unethical to do, actually. Because the researcher is not supposed to take the drug, you see. He's, he's not supposed to know what the effect of the drug is so that his knowledge doesn't. So they have these double blubble, double blind, quadruple blind, and nobody knows, and the researchers don't know, and the people don't know, and the statisticians don't know who's taking what. But those studies were already done in the 60s. You said, well, we have better control groups now, you know. <laughs> but they're just repeating the studies. It was already in the 60s when the studies that Walter Peggy did the so-called Good Friday studies, double blind placebo control, you know, and half the people had psilocybin and half the people had a control group, and then there was, the set setting was constant in a chapel doing a Good Friday service by a, led by a Howard Thurman, a fantastic black preacher, and the sessions were held in the underground thing, and they were experienced people, I was, that was one of the assistants, and uh, within half an hour, everybody knew who had the placebo and who had the drug. Within half an hour. So the rest of the experiment was pretty charade. And that's the same one now. It's exactly the same now. And it's a misguided attempt because you're not trying to prove anything, you see. You're trying to test something. You're trying to test some new possibilities. You're not trying to prove anything because you're not trying to sell anything. <laughs> so forgive me for raving on about that. So I think this double blind placebo control model has to be given a decent burial. And just forget it. I mean, there is another model, actually. There is another model, and it's called the translational model. And the translational model of social science research, you're not trying to prove anything. You're trying to find out what's the most valuable application of a particular methodology at every level. The level of the individual, the family, the culture, the society, the different classes, the different professional groups that are interested in it, like that. Translational model, look for that. That's the model. Forget the double blind placebo control model. It's a pharmaceutical thing. So.
Uh, could you please name some of the main, uh, like your main criticism of how this uh, plants and substances are being studied and researched in a scientific setting? Because you have a you have a longer outline, so you 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 are aware of a lot of studies that are being done. So what's the main criticism that you have for how these studies are conduct conducted? What's the methodology and and, and all that? Um. What, would you like him to go beyond what he's just said about the problems with the double-blind random studies? Yeah, is there something yeah, you're looking yeah. to hear? I want, I yeah. Want, I want okay. to elaborate. Yes, yes. Yes, I think I see what you mean. Uh, yeah, I, I want to say this though. What I think are the two most useful uh, avenues of research that I think would be really valuable and good and productive to pursue research and application, research and application, the translational application model, um, and uh, one is in the treatment of trauma with MDMA. I think MDMA is a unique substance among other psychedelic substances. Now, MDMA and a, a couple of, you know, two or three other substances in that same car, that, what I call them empathogenic, because they're different from all the other hallucinogenic drugs like mushrooms, LSD, mescaline, all the other DMT, all of them, because they don't produce any visions. You just see what is, and you have equanimity behind it. I call them empathogenic. They generate, they seem to generate a natural state of empathy, whatever they're looking at. They are by far the best treatment modality for the treatment of trauma that's ever been discovered. Far better than LSD, far better than psilocybin, or any other substance, because they allow the person just to look at what's happening, what's happening and not react with the stress. The stress reaction seems to be like just down. They're also fantastically useful in interpersonal relationships and communication. Um, but the chances of them being approved for that are almost nil. The chances for them are being approved in the treatment of trauma, I think, are very big because the treatment of trauma is a huge subject and PTSD is a huge need and the treatment of PTSD is huge. And uh, um, not only from accidents and just think about war trauma and there are like dozens what's what's the number like there's something like a hundred war veterans commit suicide every month every month now and they're carrying trauma from Iraq and Vietnam and, and uh, uh, I work with one traumatized Vietnam veteran and you know, the veterans, they're, they're all conditioned to be macho men. You know? They don't like to admit trauma. Well, well, they may have their legs shot out or their arms shot out, then you can have a trauma. But if they're just scared, shitless, you're not allowed to admit that. Even though it could be completely debilitating. Um, so, on the other hand, so I think the treatment of PTSD with MDMA is a huge potential. Um, on the other hand, frankly, um, I mean, Rick Doblin is a friend of mine and I support his efforts. Uh, I have my doubts whether it's going to happen. Look at the difficulties we're having in getting, a, getting alcohol decriminalized. <laughs> I mean, getting, uh, getting uh, yeah. uh, marijuana decriminalized. Uh, so. And plus, you see, so then you do, you go through all the double blind placebo control, and you do five years of studies and all these experimental groups and apply the safety, you know, prove the safety over and over again, and over again. It's been proven many times over again. It's one of the safest drugs. There are hundreds, maybe millions of people who use it MDMA recreationally all the time. Where are the corpses if it's so dangerous? Where are they? Where are the flipped out people? We're in, caught in this rigmarole social political ritual. Uh, so, uh, uh, but I think other countries are not so caught in it. So I think you're going to see uh, MDMA supported treatment centers in other countries like Switzerland, maybe South America, maybe Brazil, I don't know. Uh, maybe the Americans will get around to it uh, eventually. And I actually think that um, one, uh, one really good possibility is to set it up south of the border. You know, there's a whole tradition. People can use, 
go south of the border and you can get ibogaine treatment for addiction. Now, ibogaine is another one of these drugs that will never be accepted. But first of all, it's, it's way off, so it's not a new drug, so it can't be can't be commercialized, nobody's interested. Plus, it's used in the treatment of addicts, and it's quite toxic. So addicts have this disconcerting habit of dying with it. Because it's quite toxic, you see. You have to use this very you have to be very, very careful to set it up. So there's like about a dozen uh, evil gain alcohol uh, evil gain addiction treatment center outside of the United States, in Mexico, in Canada, in Guatemala, some other countries. And I think a model like that so it would work much better for MDMA treatment for trauma. I think why not see, for for um, uh, and for uh, um, yeah. So that's 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 one thing. And now the other thing I think uh, the other application that is most interesting would be uh, the treatment of the use of LSD or psilocybin where, uh, in the end of life studies. Now end of life. You know, there are a lot of people that have PTSD. But end of life, everybody has it. <laughs> That's 100% of the population has end of life anxiety. Guaranteed. <laughs> so the need is huge because there's no understanding what end of life actually means. Unlike many, most other cultures in the world, and historically, cross-culturally and historically, understand completely that life after death, of course, is taken for granted. It's an obvious fact. Not even a question. You don't have to prove anything. Questions, the real question is, are you prepared? And how are you prepared? And what are your expectations? And that has profound ethical and social implications, as everybody can easily recognize, you see. <laughs> and uh, somehow, see, that, got, that understanding got X'd out. And early, that was early on. So the idea of reincarnation got X out of mainstream Western religious culture in the fourth century. And they said, no, no, the Catholic Church said, we want to focus everything on this life, and you've got to be good in this life, well, otherwise you're going to have these three options, heaven, hell, and purgatory. And the most common ones are not that attractive, and, you know, so you better shape up and do the right thing. From a point of view of religious history, that's an absurd <coughs> oversimplification, and it's not true. Those are not the three options. <laughs> the, the reality is, the reality is that the afterlife worlds are uh, at least as complex and infinitely varied as the, this life. How could it be otherwise? You think about it for a second of, you know, how could it be otherwise? You come back to the multi-dimensional world in which we've always lived, in which we shut off once we get born, for a purpose. So, uh, I think end of life studies where people are given, and Aldous Huxley, see, pioneered the whole thing. Not necessarily even giving, taking LSD at the moment of dying, which is what he did, but taking it in preparation for dying, setting up centers. Just like now we have, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, what are the studies called where you, the, somebody comes into your home when you're dying? The hospice. hospice. Right, you could envision an expansion of the hospice model. Uh, where people could be offered uh, a low dose LSD or psilocybin experience. Optionally, of course, always, yeah, optionally. And you're not trying to prove anything, you're not trying to test anything. And there are some studies, uh, I, won't, I won't mention them because I'm protective of them, uh, where people are in a sort of applied model, trying to introduce a good practice, a healthy practice, a socially productive uh, practice into the society. Uh, and uh, uh, that help people prepare themselves in their own way. And it doesn't have to be religious, it doesn't have to be Jewish, Christian, Buddhist, or anything else. Whatever your life, whatever your religion is, you see. Uh, and all the religions have different views, of course. Uh, again, you're not trying to prove anything, you're just trying to make it a transition into, the, because it is, it is the great transition into the unknown. That reminds, uh, two great transitions into the unknown that go from where you go from something that you know that's narrow into an expanded world that's bigger but unknown, except you know it's bigger. There was a cartoon that was published in the in the newspaper of newsletter of the Association for Pre and Perinatal Psychology and Health. There is such an association. It's interesting, you know, all the years I was dean at the at, the, at this institute, there were never any courses on prenatal psychology. Prenatal psychology is a huge field. 
prenatal psychology and health, the huge field of literature, research, studies, theories, <coughs> and uh, memories. People can remember everything about their prenatal existence. You have to go into a hypnotic state. Not drugs, no drugs. Just go into a hypnotic state to recover the memories. So, in the cartoon, there were uh, two fetuses hanging side by side. Maybe they were twins. And uh, one of them says, has a little thought balloon that says, what happens after birth? The other one says, we don't know. Nobody's come back to tell us. <laughs> See that one? That's, that's an interesting joke. See, it has a depth charge to it. <laughs> has one level and then another level. <laughs> Nobody's come back to tell us. So, uh, and that's the most ancient, that's the most ancient tradition of using psychedelic substances. That's the mystery of religions. That's elusive. Preparing for dying. So how do you prepare for something you don't know what it's going to be? Well, you can only go by what others have said. And there's some kind of intuitive, and of course you don't have to wait. The idea was not to wait, but to go there before. And so that's a whole other psychology, you see. You can't just treat it like regular psychology. You can't do double blind placebo control studies on this. This is where psychology and science shades over into spirituality and religion. And you know, you got to respect those boundaries. Don't do double blind placebo control studies of religious experience. I think it's, it smells bad. I don't like it. It's inappropriate. It's unnecessary. It's unnecessary. And disrespectful. Let people have their own religious practices, their spiritual practices, and their belief. Don't interfere with it. But if people ask for help, be available to help. As asked. Am I raving? What's the time? We got time. How about another question? There's a hand over there. This one in the front, one in the back, one over here. Find a microphone. Hey, Ralph, can you hear me? Can you speak a little yeah. louder? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I think one of the big questions that isn't being asked or isn't being discussed is the plausibility of Terence McKenna's stone date theory that we actually evolved you know, into human beings with the use of psilocybin mushrooms. Is, is what theory? This stone date theory. Oh, the stone date theory. Yeah, yeah. I think it's and I, I come to a lot of these, you know, events, a lot of these talks, and it seems like uh, this is almost like the elephant in the room sometimes because we talk about how effective these medicines are, but we never actually discuss our own evolutionary history or relationship with these medicines. And I was just wondering if you cared to speak to that. Well, Terence McKenna was a great friend of mine, and I think the stone date theory is as good a theory as any other about evolution. I mean, there's no way to prove it, nor is that the point, you see. You're not really trying to prove anything. Um, well, people do argue about, you know, did uh, scholars argue about did the, uh, did the Vedic people, you know, have soma and was soma a mushroom and which mushroom was it uh, and all that kind of thing. But uh, uh, and the, the thing is always like the generalization, you see. Uh, the, I mean, the psilocybin and psilocybin mushrooms do stimulate the language centers. I mean, that's been proven. That's been proven with double blind placebo control studies. <laughs> so you've got chatt chattering monkeys that start to think about, you know, start making words and singing, for example, singing. A lot of biological researchers think now well, singing came before talking. And they have drum singing and drumming and da da, you know, da 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 da, da right? just like those ayahuasca guys <laughs> chanting and singing. And then, and then, and symbol, at some point, discovering symbol making, because you have to have the symbols in order to identify the different plants. And then you, you take this mushroom, you get this kind of thing, and then you take this other mushroom, no, it'll make you dead. <laughs> That's very important <laughs> to be able to identify the different plants and mushrooms, and you have words for that. So it's all tied into the development of language. And uh, so that makes a lot of sense to me. Now, whether it's you know the key to every human evolution, I don't know. I don't think there's probably one key to evolution. There's probably lots of keys to evolution. Were you the same person that just asked that question, or are you asking another question? 
No, I wanted to comment on, on this. Oh. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a thing, someone over here with their hand up. So, yes, Terence McKenna's theory, I think, is great. It's a good theory. We need more theories like that. And it's, even, it's critiqued by people who have never taken mushrooms. So they, they have no basis for critiquing it, you see. I think scientists who have not had those kinds of psychedelic experiences should not be mouthing off about, uh, about what it is, because they've not looked through the microscope. It's like people who haven't looked through the microscope, like the priests in the, in the Middle Ages who didn't look through the telescope. They say, we don't need to look through your Jupiter telescope. We know that there are any moons around Jupiter, because otherwise, you know, the church would have said so. You, know. so you disqualify yourself unless you've made the observation yourself. But that's a, that's that's uh, an issue, but Tennant didn't care about that. He was far too savvy to be bothered for that. <laughs> I think his theory is great. I also think his theory about mushrooms being intergalactic spores left by advanced civilizations from other galaxies, I think it's, that's very far out and seems very plausible to me. Why should it not be, you see, considering what we now know about the vastness of the universe and the many worlds and the galaxies and the galactic clusters? Why should that be so unheard of and so unplausible <laughs> that uh, some useful method for stimulating the mushrooms definitely stimulate language development, stimulate brain development? So, um, I, was, yeah. I was wondering if you could talk more about the responsibility that comes with expanding your consciousness with uh, psychedelics, especially when it comes to tapping into the collective consciousness. Um, I really liked the example you gave um, of you on ayahuasca and tapping into uh, the civil war pain in Salvador. And how does one prepare for that kind of experience of tapping into collective pain and becoming a channel for a large amount of pain like that? Like, what is that responsibility and how does one prepare for it? Um, what, what is the responsibility in a moral sense when we tap into the kind of stream you did of consciousness when you were feeling the genocide happening in Salvador? What's our responsibility and preparation for something like that? And, and perhaps what to do with the aftermath and how to integrate? So is that yeah. clear, Marie? Yeah, how yeah. do you prepare well, yeah. and how do you also deal yeah. with that? Well, that, exactly. That's where it all comes down to preparation, you see. What was the... Um, uh, when I participated in that particular group, it was like most of the groups and the... You know, People didn't have any specific preparation, um, and that's why I'm uh, emphasizing the book Alice for Awakening. The more specific your preparation, and therefore the, the, the intention of what you're doing, uh, then the more specific the answer, answers you're going to get. You know? uh, and uh, if you don't have, an, have a specific intention to heal something specific or to find out something or to know or to learn something specific. Well, it may or may not happen. Now, in the case of trauma, for example, it's obvious the person wants to heal the trauma. But in the case where you're just exploring, then, you know, what are you exploring? Um, and so, yes, uh, so the, to, suddenly tuning into genocidal warfare going on in El Salvador, that it would raise the question of like, what am I going to do about it? But that could be, that could be in any state of consciousness. You could just be reading a book and finding out about it and then being outraged and shocked whether you're El Salvadoran or not, and then figure out, well, what am I going to do about this? You suddenly you know, tune into this information. Maybe you all saw a documentary. Or, you know, uh, and you, well, so in the first part, place, you realize the, the substance is making you aware in a very visceral way of um, our interconnectedness. Not just we have the information, but we can actually experience it. I'll give you another example. Um, this one is actually hard for me to talk about, but here it is. So, um, I was taking a psychedelic substance, I don't need to say which one it is, it doesn't matter which one it is actually. 
And this was at the time when, uh, you remember, the, this was about five years ago, there was a woman, an American woman, who was in Israel, Palestine. She was protesting the Israelis building a wall. And she was won over by a bulldozer. You remember that story? Yeah. About five years ago. So I took this substance. I, it, I, I had read the story, of course. And uh, I became the girl. I was won over by a bulldozer in the mud. I felt the destruction, the whole thing. The feelings, the whole thing. Totally unexpected. Just because I'm a human being, and she was a human being, and I had the emotional resonance just like other human beings. But normally we wouldn't have it like with that intensity, you see. That's why the, and that's one of the reasons why the, the shamanic cultures uh, uh, also, they, they don't just go into these experiences. They do a lot of preparation. The shamans do a lot of preparation, you see. And, and, and in fact, they have to go through this. They go they go through this long training. They have to protect themselves because if they take on the stuff that the clients are bringing, they'd be dead. In fact, sometimes they do die. So they have to connect with the spirit. How do they do that? They connect with the spirits. The shamans say, they, "I'm not doing the healing. It's being done by the spirits through me." And that's a very difficult lesson for Westerners to learn because Westerners don't believe in spirits. How can you let spirits heal something if you don't believe spirits exist, you see? That's a big obstacle. <laughs> but it hasn't been proven that they exist, all right? <laughs> okay, well then you probably shouldn't do shamanic work. <laughs> so it's challenging in that way. Uh, so, um, shamanic work is not fun, necessarily. Not at all. Recreational drug use is another story. In my book, I really don't include recreational drug use, not because I'm opposed to it, but because it's not that relevant to uh, you know, doing, using these substances for personal growth or healing or acquiring knowledge and like that. Uh, recreational drug users don't, they don't want to read a book about preparation anyway. Take acid and go dancing. It's okay. As long as you're not hurting anybody else, I don't see why anybody should be concerned about it. See, I believe in the abolition of all drugs without victims. Crimes without victims should just be abolished, period. We don't need crimes without victims. We have enough crimes with victims. <laughs> and we should take care of the victims. You know, and the criminals, make sure that, that the criminals are uh, punished appropriately. Not worry about people's drug habits or sexual habits. The drug habits and the sexual habits are people in a private sphere. And the state, the government should Stay out of it. That's, in that sense, I'm a libertarian, not in some of the other sense that the libertarians have. It's kind of muddy. But, uh, in that sense, I think they're absolutely right. This is the private sphere. As long as it's not interfering with anybody else, it's none of the state's business. And it shouldn't remain that way. That's my political rant. <laughs> well, we have another question over here. Doctor, uh, in honor of. Uh, Mr. Mason, um, you know, you talked about palliative care. Um, my experience is that um, psychedelics will put you in touch with the, with spirituality, and so I think that's it's it's really hard if you take that not to have an experience like that. So um, I think that for that reason, it's a it's a good. Uh, substance you know, to take toward the end of life if, you, if you've not done any kind of spiritual work. But have you thought about, we've talked about this and it's been a fascinating discussion about how the psychedelics, how they're alike and then how they're different. Um, could you talk any more, have you thought about comparing, contrasting uh, psilocybin, LSD, um, well, no, I don't I agree with that first part of the statement. I don't think psychedelic drugs put you in touch with spiritual realities. They can. They, no, they can. It's not a drug effect. Charlie Manson took LSD and committed mass murder with it. The CIA gave LSD to people and committed brainwashing with it. 
The drug does not produce a psychic spiritual experience. People can have spiritual experiences facilitated by the drug. They can also have them without the drug. And they can also have drug experiences that are not spiritual at all. See, it's very complicated and difficult to talk about. And when you have a spiritual experience, it's not a drug effect. And of course, you, it, it's like, but that's why these drugs are not like any other drugs, you see. They take the tranquilizer, they take Librium or Quaalude or whatever it is, they say, well, it produces this state of well-being. You can't say that. Somebody asks you, what, what does LSD do? Well, you have to say, well, it depends on the setting, the setting and your belief system and your history and the, the as well as a drug, of course. <laughs> but I think the differences between the drugs are relatively insignificant. That's what the, you know, the differences between LSD and mescaline, psilocybin, and mushrooms, all, all these ayahuasca, are relatively insignificant. Now, MDMA, I think the empathogenic drugs, because they don't produce any visions, is a, is a different category, some of a different category. And for that reason, for that reason particularly, it's extremely useful and most valuable. Another reason why it's extremely valuable and why this strange effect, you know, that I coined the term empathogenic, you know, and why you have this rave culture where people take ecstasy and they dance and they're by the thousands, and you know, there's something, nobody feels threatened by anybody else, kind of women don't feel totally safe. Because why? Because MDMA secretes prolactin, and prolactin is the nursing hormone. They secrete prolactin and oxytocin, oxytocin, cuddling hormone. Prolactin is a nursing hormone. You feel like a nursing baby. And it's not a sexual experience. And MDMA, actually, uh, men often can't get an erection. In fact, I know studies of uh, people that went to shamans, ayahuasca shamans in South America, and then they went, uh, this one woman, but I won't laugh about it. She's a client of mine in therapy. So she went to South America to take ayahuasca with a shaman. And the shaman was close to having sex with all the American women that came down. And she brought him MDMA and ecstasy. And, uh, and said, this is our you know, ayahuasca. <laughs> he took it, he said. He hated it because he couldn't get an erection in order to have sex with her. Because people with ecstasy, they just want to cuddle, you see. They want to have sex. It's like a nursing infant, just cuddle, close, be close, touch, smooch. That's why people feel safe with it. You can dance with 2,000 other people, all high on ecstasy, and feel safe. Women feel totally safe. Nobody's going to come on for them. But they may cuddle, or they may just be happy playing around, <laughs> enjoying themselves and dancing. So in that sense, it's a real gift to society. <laughs> And good in therapy too, you see, because you don't, therapy, therapy, uh, sexual feelings and therapy is, is a definite drawback. It's a no-no. It's a problem to deal with for the therapist and the client. Now, this is completely out of that, you see. So, uh, maybe they're awaiting our own development of some kind of uh, integrity or something. <coughs> some kind of change in world view. Uh, and, uh, there are now people who are experimenting with extremely small doses of LSD, micro, what they call micro doses. But you don't really go on a trip. You know, a classical trip is like a, the beginning of the trip and it lasts for a certain duration and then the trip ends and you come back to normal reality. And people use these micro doses and Hoffman did that himself. He told me he was taking 50 micrograms or 30 micrograms or 10 micrograms. Most people would say, well, it's not right? But he said, just to help me think. Now people are taking micro doses of LSD in mountain climbers, climbing up the Iger North Wall, or doing like extreme skiing. Not to be recommended to ordinary people who are not trained, you see, but highly skilled people, highly skilled in sensory motor skills, might find it a mad, are finding a pantry. And they're not writing about it, and they're not publishing it for obvious reasons. 
finding that their attentive possibilities are greatly, can be greatly enhanced. You see, it requires a certain... So the possibilities are huge. But as I said, that I think society at large, I think the most useful thing for uh, applications for uh, LSD and psilocybin would be in the treatment of uh, uh, or or, uh, or uh, for, uh, for MDMA would be the treatment of trauma. For LSD and and, uh, and psilocybin would be the preparation for dying, and also in the treatment of addiction. And I think for the treatment of addiction, see, there were like six alcohol treatment, alcoholism treatment center with LSD in the 60s before, in Canada and North America. Six different clinics where you could get LSD treatment of alcoholism. See, consciousness expanding drugs uh, are, are the natural treatment for consciousness contracting drugs. The addictions are consciousness contracted states where you focused on you know, getting the drug, getting that same drug, and that same drug and drink or drug or whatever it is, again and again and again. And therapy with addiction involves expanding consciousness. Uh, so I think just like there were these alcoholism treatments in, the, in Canada and other places, I think I, I could envision uh, an alcoholism. Alcoholism is still a huge problem, a huge social problem. And I think the better from a the, the most socially beneficial thing would come from a treatment center, again, set up in Mexico, because you don't have to go through the, so many regulations. Mexican doctors are good doctors. You can just find many knowledgeable, experienced doctors in Mexico, just as you can in the United States. And they know what they're doing. They don't have this overweight of regulation and stuff. So you could, like you can do now, you can have people getting treatment. You could have alcoholism treatment center. And it should be part of a... Uh, so like a two-week program, you know, where you have the detox, and then you have all the dietary changes, and you could have uh, yoga and, and, uh, and dietary changes and herbs and medicine like that, and then maybe one or two um, treatment programs, treatment sessions, voluntary, of course, to those who wanted them with uh, with psilocybin, which is shorter acting rather than the ten hours need for LSD and just four or five hours for psilocybin for those that wanted to, I think, and integrate it into a two week program by people who can know it. And there's lots of people who are knowledgeable about running those kind of sessions. That would be, I think, it would give you the biggest social benefit of of these kinds of programs. And not that difficult to do. It costs a lot less to do it in Mexico than try to, you know, all the regulatory hurdles that you have to go through in the United States. Well, we have time for one more question. And one there was question, a question yes. that was on the floor here in the front row. Oh. Or wait, why, why don't you take the mic? Yeah. That was me. Um, I heard you say we should give the double blind controlled tri trial a decent burial. You should what? That we should give the double blind controlled trial a decent burial. To the what? We should give the double blind Mind. controlled trial a decent burial. Oh yeah, well, yeah, but you know, it's not up to me to to do that. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's um, what people want to put. You know, it's, it's a shame. It's a waste. I'm just wondering though. And I feel sorry for the poor doctors that would like to do the studies. You know, and the, the doctors see the doctors have put who want to be healers, and they're put into this horrible situation. They can't use the method that they know. And they not only know, they didn't know that can be healed, there's already been proven that can be healed, and they've already experienced it on their own. They're not even allowed to admit that. But if they admit that they've experienced it themselves, they're automatically disqualified. And I think that's backwards. They would be disqualified if they haven't experienced it. So that's what we're up against. That's what we're into. Is there anything that is that can be commonly recognized as a scientific methodology that could be used more appropriately to look at this? Yes, I think that, as I mentioned, the translational model is from applied psychology. From applied psychology, where you have certain scientific findings, it's a systems view. You, do, you look at systematically all the, all the communities, all the stakeholders, what they call the stakeholders that are involved in this. You know, the, the doctors and the medical people and the regulatory and the da 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 da, and the safety and the police and the da. All of those factors, all, you know, so it's lost organizational and people that are really knowledgeable in the different systems of government at every level. Uh, it involves a lot of talking, a lot of meeting, a lot of bureaucratic uh, maneuvering. 
but that but that's how it's done go for it it's worth it it's a systems approach Ad applied applied systems approach. how can we develop systems that can apply uh, apply these models to get the double blind placebo control well or not you know do it now that you've proved that you know, now we've proven it see but that's the thing that gets to me now we've proven it and uh, the veterans Okay, so you prove MDMA, and you know that involves two fantastic therapists, Michael and Annie Mitoff, who stay with the person for like six hours or ten hours or overnight and the night before. What therapist can afford that? No therapist can afford that. So the application possibilities are zero. But on the other hand, see, I was talking to somebody who's in this audience about this, and he. I said, well, you know, it's so ridiculous. The people who are doing the MDMA studies, included, in which I included myself, were with war trauma. Well, I don't have a war trauma. I have other trauma, but I don't have a war trauma. The people who should be working with war trauma, traumatized people, are other people who have had war traumas, of which there are lots, millions of them, millions of them. And, and that's the AA model. Previous Alcoholics who cured themselves of their alcoholism are the best people to work with current alcoholics who are trying to cure themselves of their alcoholism because they've been there and they know what it takes. And uh, that model, see, that's a social model, it's not a medical model at all. It's a social model. And that, what this friend of mine pointed out, is in fact what they're doing. Because it's actually, actually easier for the average war veteran to get hold of MDMA than it would be for the ag average psychiatric researcher. MDMA is a ridiculously cheaply available drug. You can buy it on, you know. And of course, there's always the qualification where it may not be good quality, but hey, you know, government researchers aren't the only people who know how to make a good quality drug. I'm not telling anybody anything they don't know, don't know already. <laughs> well, that's a good note to end. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your attention.